Welcome to the Bad Beat Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Eisenstadt. Today we have a good buddy of mine, Matt Jaskell, on the show. Uh, he's a professional race car driver, professional uh, skydiver, and professional badass. Um, yeah, we're actually now technically family. Uh, this is my wife's cousin, which is really awesome. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. I think we're going to have a lot of impactful moments and be able to share a lot of great content. Uh, just try not to make me cry yeah. too deep into my life. But yeah. no, man, I appreciate it. Yeah, we are family. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. And there's a cool story of, uh, you know, my life intertwined with, you know, your wife's. And um, and yeah, she's, her family is really responsible for a lot of my racing career. So it's cool, man. Thanks for having me here. Yeah. And uh, so Sierra, my wife, her grandfather, Chuck Shaver, uh, started Shaver Racing Engines, which that's kind of how you got into racing, period, right? It is. You know, I started out in motocross five years old here in Vegas. And, um, and that was really just my dad, you know, like my, my, my parents. Um, and it wasn't until about five years after that, being about 10 years old, first head injury in motocross, of course, mom, mom wasn't so stoked about, about me continuing in motocross. And neither was I even for that fact. I loved motocross, but I was like, man, this is a, you know, it's, I, I was very mindful for my age, I think. And, uh, and then my uncle was always given my you know, uncle Chuck, he was giving my dad a hard time, bring him over here to the car track and the motocross track here in Vegas. It was before the speedway was even built, which is cool, you know, like going back, getting old now. And yeah. so, um, so there's the, there was a motocross track and a go-kart track. The, the big speedway wasn't even built yet. And I literally in my motocross gear one day went over to the go-kart track and, uh, my uncle Chuck put me in my first cart and then it's a long, you know, the rest is history we say from there, but yeah, I, I switched from f two wheels to four at that, at that time. And, and, uh, when I was around 10 and that was because of my uncle Chuck and then he was responsible for my first ever championship, my first wins in go-kart racing, which is, you know, what I believe led my career to where I am today. Is that, is that, that's pretty much all you were doing was just racing go-karts every day, huh? No, not, not every day. I mean, you know, like a typical kid, I mean, I was in school and, and, uh, and, and I've gotten this question a lot throughout life. You know, my parents were not rich, you know, and like, whether it's uh politically correct or not, but we always called ourselves high class white trash. You know, my, <laughs> my dad was just a hard working man on his, literally on his hands and knees. He was a hardwood floor installer. He wow. was kicking carpet and stalling hardwood floors, but he busted his ass. I mean, this guy literally worked seven days a week and yeah. 12 hour days or more, you know, 15 hour days. And, um, but he brought home good money, you know? Yeah. And so we were able to go play, you know, we played, you know, it was before, you know, the cliche now, but man, we, we lived, we were the first of like work hard, play hard type family. You know, my dad just worked really hard. My mom was, you know, doing real estate and, and raising two boys, myself and my brother. And, um, and we played hard, man. We had toys. We had, you know, the cabin up in, uh, we had a cabin up in Utah before, before Sierra and her family did, you know, like we had a cabin oh. up there and doing the snow. Yeah. That we, you know, we had, know yeah. So we had, we actually were the first to have the cabin up there before they did and snowmobiles and dirt bikes and four wheelers. I mean, like there was video that Sierra showed me. I'm five or six and I'm sitting on a banshee at oh, competition. In, in Dumont. Uh, Dumont. Yeah. Competition Hill, man. So that like we were a gearhead family and, um, and, and even though I got to live a really nice life, it didn't, it came, it came at a cost also, you know, there, there was a lot of family setbacks and stuff like that. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I got to, I got to go racing and, and, um, and I, and I, and I, again, I was really mindful because I've always been like a very overly empathetic, overly emotional kind of person. Like I, I always saw things, I, you know, I saw kids that didn't have what I had. I saw kids like showing up in the back of a beat up truck. You know, we had a, we had a nice truck, we had a nice trailer, you know? And so I was always very mindful of like, okay, man, we got, you know, we have some nice stuff and I'm lucky to be doing this, you know? That's really good. Yeah. A lot of people don't have that mindset. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, so when you were starting to grow up and you're starting all this racing, um, were you working at all or? Yeah. So no, not, at, <laughs> not at 10. <laughs> I love when people ask me, like I, I was born in California and what part of California? Uh, in a uh, Westlake village, which is like North of Santa Monica mm -hmm. and only lived there until I was like, five. so the story always goes like, yeah, yeah. Born in California, lived there until I was five and then moved to Vegas. And everybody always says, what brought you to Vegas? I'm like, oh, you know, I knew th the housing market was booming. <laughs> I was making moves. My you fucking know? parents. It's like I was investing in private. It was my fucking parents right. movie. I didn't have a choice. I was five. Um, so yeah, I just came to Vegas when I was five years old. And, uh, and like I said, yeah, start jumped right into motocross, but, um, you know, so <sighs> 10 years old, you know, like my, my life was consumed by racing. So I was just going to school and racing. But by the time I was 14 years old, when it, like since you asked, I, as soon as I turned 14, I had a job at the go-kart track. Oh, awesome. Yeah, man, I was pulling weeds and, and working. And my mom actually was really didn't like it, you know, because like I was working all the time. 
And by the time I was, this was cool. Like something I'm proud of, you know, like, cause I busted my ass. I worked hard. I had made roughly, I had made close to $30,000 in my first 12 months of working from 14 into 15 years old. And my mom actually like fought with my, she's like a, a, a young man shouldn't be working this much at four, you know, as a teenager, is that, you know, it's like the, the late nineties. Yeah. Late nineties, like 99, 2000, you know, it wasn't even 2000 yet. It's like great money. Yeah. Well, it was making really good money, but I was working. I was working seven days a week during the summer. I would work from nine in the morning till nine o'clock at night during the summer, like until the, you know, when the track opened, till it shut down. It's just what I wanted to do. My life was consumed by racing. And so my mom and I, I remember my parents having fights about like, this isn't normal, you know, like even though I was a good kid and everything. It just, yeah. she, I think, I think my mom, well, I can tell you what, I mean, that's another thing we'll step into in a minute. Cause there was reasons why my mom didn't love the racing and it, it was, it was for good reason. Um, she wasn't, and she wasn't completely wrong either, but, uh, she didn't fully support the lifestyle, you know? Mm. I mean, we we're traveling. I mean, you know, I was having trouble at school because I wasn't key and I was a decent, somewhat smart kid, <laughs> but, uh, you're focused on racing. Yeah, man. Like, I mean, I wasn't failing, but I wasn't, I was a C, I was a C plus student at best, you know, like, I mean, I'm, I'm missing a lot of school and we're getting in trouble with the school districts cause I'm missing so many days and stuff. And by the time I'm 15, going into 16 years old, it's basically, uh, I've basically, I, I like to say, turned professional. Like, I got my first scholarship. It's a $50,000 scholarship to move into car racing. It was called the Skip Barber Series. Like, it's still around what? today. Yeah, Skip Barber is, like, probably one of the biggest racing schools in the world. It, it, like it's Where's been, that? It's, uh, well, it's all over. It used to be at, like, Laguna Seca, famous racetrack, yep. you know, and then now it's at the Circuit of the Americas, the F1 track in Austin. It's a racing school that's been around for many, many, many years, and a lot of a lot of big name race car drivers got their start that way. They had a karting scholarship. So as you were coming up through karting, you could apply for it and compete against other drivers. And I mean, it was just, you know, I, I don't know. I kind of try to explain or equate it to people of like what I was doing, I guess would be very similar to the equivalent of trying to be like a young Hollywood actor, you know, like very political, very financial, very, a lot of nepotism. I didn't even know what that word meant until I was racing. You know, I'm racing against big name. I'm racing against like, I don't know what that word means now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, fa you know, it's like family money, stuff like that. Oh, okay. Like, I was racing against kids who, I was racing against Marco Andretti, Mario Andretti's grandson. You know, oh. I'm racing against guys like that. I'm racing against Graham Rahal. Bobby Rahal was a famous American Indy 500 champion. Like, I'm racing against guys with big names and lots of money behind them. Yeah. And, there, and there was a lot of politics, man. Like, and it was traumatic, you know, being, like, I, I lost the first year that I tried to win the scholarship, this like big, and my family didn't have the money. So we had like, when I say like high class white trash, like we had just enough money to go racing and have some cool toys, but not enough for me to go professional race car driving. Right. Like, like a lot of other people. But it's so much money. My God, dude, like I said, so to race go-karts for a year back then was close to $50,000 for a, for a year. That's like insane. it's insane, dude. That's yeah. it's somebody's entire life salary for the year. Yep. To go race, to go race go karts, yep. to try to move your career. So, like, I mean, I think we spent probably thirty five grand one year for me to race to win some championships in like nineteen ninety eight, ninety nine, racing go karts. And then again, obviously, that caused some family family drama. You know, my mom knowing how you know how much money or or my dad at the time was hiding it. You know, trying to not let my mother know how much money we were spending on racing. Is and that why she didn't support it? It wasn't the money. I'll get to that. Cause it wasn't, I, you know, I don't think she loved the money we were spending, but it, it wasn't just that it, it definitely was like the danger part of things. She knew that there was a chance that it wasn't going to work out. And I, I think she, I, I want to believe it. Cause I do. I mean, I've had some pretty deep talks with my mom about it. She didn't want her baby boy to be d devastated or be destroyed. And you know, or hurt, or injured, or killed, you know, I mean, there was kids, I, I was racing go-kart tracks where a kid died, you know, like, I, I mean, yeah. and then you move into cars, and, and, you know, a lot, I've seen some shit happen, you know, I've yeah. literally, there's been kids that have died in go-kart racing, and tracks that I've been at, and stuff like that, I mean, it was dangerous, it was, it was risky, and, um, and for what, you know, like, my mom, you know, she knew that it was just such a small chance to make it as we say make it meaning you're making a million dollars a year right. racing cars you know and so i don't think she wanted me to be let down you know she uh she knew that i was talented she knew i was quick but um 
So there was, a, like I said, it's so confusing and like it's a complicated, complex life. But that's where that's where we're here to talk about it, right? So, yeah. so in my teens, I'm racing for a very famous race car driver at the time. He was the the most famous name in motorsports at the time, really. Like even Formula One, everything. His name is Paul Tracy. Still around today, but he was uh, he raced for Team Cool Green Cigarettes at the time in IndyCar, and he was just one of the biggest names. And he was the bad boy racing, and um, and he lived here in Vegas, like a lot of famous race car drivers, because of obvious tax reasons, part. Party, thing, yep. party scene. Back in the good old days, man, Vegas was the spot for, for all the famous drivers. And uh, he started a go-kart team and he scouted me. He was like, I want this kid. This kid's like the fastest kid in Vegas, one of the fastest in North America. I'd, I'd won a big championship and stuff. And he was like, all right, I want this kid to race for me. And, and how old um, are you? I was 14 when he found me. I was 14 when he found me. I was only 15 going on 16 when he signed me to a contract, you know, a race for him. And that, and that, that's when I said, like, I turned professional. He was paying for everything. You know, he's covering everything, paying travel bills, everything. And, um, and man, if it, we, we had our fights throughout the year. Like, I raced for him for, like, nearly three years. During that time, a, a pretty famous racing driver now to this day, uh, A.J. Allmendinger, who races NASCAR currently. He was my teammate. We raced together. We hated each other. We had a bit of a rivalry. And, and um and so Paul and I, you know, we butted heads a few times and, and I ended up leaving the team after three years, but without Paul, my career wouldn't, I wouldn't, I honestly wouldn't have made it to NASCAR. I believe like he paved the way when my parents couldn't pay for it. You know? So like, like I said, when I started getting into the professional karting, moving, getting ready to move into car racing, my parents couldn't afford it. And so Paul covered all the bills and because of the championship that I raced for Paul, I got scouted for the Skip Barber scholarship, the race, the you know, moving into the race car, won that fifty thousand dollars scholarship. I went into that championship, and at the time, you're still racing go karts, you're racing carts, you're racing cars. It was like a twelve race championship in the cars around the entire country. And for those that don't know, it's like a miniature, it's junior Formula One or junior Indy car. It was called like a, it was like a Formula Two Thousand, as you'd call it. Looks like an Indy car, has wings, slick tires, sequential gearbox, oh, yeah. but it's slow. You know, it's like when I say slow, it's like it's like two hundred horsepower, but the car only weighs fifteen hundred pounds. I mean, oh, it's, wow. it's still we're still doing a buck fifty. You know, you're fifteen years old, you're doing one hundred fifty miles an hour in a proper race car and um so i i I get i get into that championship on a scholarship and i finish second i finish second in the championship i win multiple races and we're racing at all the coolest racetracks in america we're racing at sebring florida we're racing at road america laguna seca you know everywhere all all the cool tracks in america like 17 years old not even not even 17 years yeah traveling the country at the time yeah and um and it is a weird life you know you grow up you, you don't have a choice. You grow up really fast, you know, and, and there's a lot of politics. There's a lot of drama that, that, you know, again, well, that, you know, it's kind of what shaped and molded me who I am today, but you know, you're, you're being pressured in like, no matter how good you do, even if you win a race, it's like, cool story, bro. Next one, next one, yep. you know, and, and, uh, you know, you're always expected to do better than the next week. And it's, there's always the, sick feeling in your stomach of like, well, where, what are we going to do next year? Well, okay. To move to a bigger championship is $150,000 for the year. And where's that money going to come from? And who's going to sponsor me for that? And will I be fast enough to get, cho- you know, it's, it's, it's a never ending chase. It's just a fucking never ending chase, man. And, and nobody will ever truly understand as much as I'm grateful for what I did. I mean, like I, I know I had a very privileged life to go do these things, but I fucking dedicated my life to it. Also, I gave up, I gave up my entire childhood. I was focused. I was a good kid. You know, I, I I worked really hard to devote my life to that at the same time, you know, and, and, and it did let me down multiple times in my life, you know, even to, even to this day to where we are right now. And so I'm, for those wondering, I'm 30, I hate, hate Sherry, but I'm 38 years old now. And I mean, this journey has been my entire life. It's been more than 30 years. Um, so in this in this championship, the Skip Barber deal, I finished second, and I was the. It was a, a very difficult championship. Marco Andretti was younger. He was, you know, Mario's grandson. He yep. wasn't even racing against us because he was in a category lower. We were racing in the national series, and he was racing in the the regional series because he he hadn't moved up to that series yet. So, but there was a lot of really you know, fast drivers at the time. And there was a lot of, you're up against a lot of Europeans or South Americans, like Brazilians and Mexicans and really fast drivers from all over the world. It wasn't just an American championship. There, there was probably 25 drivers in the championship. And I think less than half were Americans. And where was that at? It was all over the country. That was the Skip Barber deal. Oh, gotcha. The, the scholarship thing I won. And so I, I'm, I finished second in the championship and uh, highest finishing American, a Brazilian guy won the championship. And, um, and I got scouted by Red Bull. 
And that's how, you know, a lot of my life story revolves around my Red Bull time because that was a big deal. That was uh, to make it, that was to try to make it to Formula One. It was so Red Bull back in the uh, early to in the mid 2000 or like early 2000s, 2003, four, five, developed a program to try to get an American back in Formula One. Formula One is the pinnacle of all motorsports, right? Yep. And um, even even bigger now because of Drive to Survive on Netflix, right? So, so at the time, well, it's the, huge here now. It's huge here now, right? And so, like, and, and it is. It still was the biggest sport in the world next to soccer, and and as and um, you know, and that is again, that's the ultimate goal as a racing driver. Even though it's it's very unrealistic for Americans, it's very un- unrealistic for any racing to driver. To race F one. It's 22, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of racing drivers trying to become racing drivers, and there's 22 seats. That's true. And a lot of times it costs money to be there. Yeah. There's drivers. If there's 22 seats in Formula 1, sometimes only 20 seats, and I think they've run 22, sometimes it's 20. If there's, if there's 20 seats in Formula 1, five are highly paid professionals. The other five are moderately paid, and the other half of the field is paying to be there. They're paying. They're paying tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to be in a seat. It's hard to wrap. Ra- doesn't even seem real. It's hard to wrap your head what? around. Yeah. Yeah, man. You got to pay. There's, I, I can name drivers who, oh, who's that? Like Lance Stroll, if you're a Formula One fan. His father owns the fucking team. <laughs> he's, he's not saying he's like a terrible driver, but there's drivers a lot better than him. And the reason he's in Formula One is, yes, because his father owns, bought the Formula One team for $400 million and... His kid's a Formula One driver now. So that's, that's the kind insane. of shit. Yeah, dude, that's what you're up against when you. So I feel bad. I don't want to be like pessimistic, but I, I've mentored a lot of young drivers. I got to mentor and coach and train the 100th uh, running winner of the Indy 500, the biggest race in the world, uh, the biggest sporting, the biggest single day sporting event in the world. It's a, that's a whole cool story. And so, I mean, I've mentored and been a part of other successful racing drivers careers. And when they come to me and say, I want to go to Formula One, I'm like, get that out of your head now. It's like, I'm not trying to crush your dreams. You can be a professional race car driver, but be realistic so that you don't pour all your energy into something that might not happen or most likely is not going to happen, you know? Right. So, so I get chosen by Red Bull to be part of the American Formula One driver search program. And it's, and it was an effort to get an American back in Formula One because there had not been one since Michael Andretti. And Michael is a badass, but again, if it wasn't for the fact that he was Mario Andretti's grandson, he might not have made it to Formula One, you know? And and uh, and so that was the last American in Formula One uh, that, that had been there. And that was in 1992, 93, 94. And so now we're in 2005, 2004, 2003, 2004. And Red Bull was like, okay, let's try. And it wasn't really Red Bull. It was this American woman who had been involved in Formula One, and she wanted to see a Formula an American back in Formula One. So she partnered with Red Bull. And listen, it's it's just my side of the story, but I can tell you a lot of dark shit that happened within that driver search. You know, it's like a lot of people would say that Red Bull never cared to have an American back in Formula One. It was all smoke and mirrors and politics and and you know just just a lot of marketing and, and BS, you know, right. and, and so I was a part of this program and, and, um, I will say that I thought there was hope, you know, like I was like, Oh my God, I might make it to formula one, you know, yeah. like here I am, I got chosen and I'm winning races and I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. And, you know, and, and the kind of the story I tell not, not to tell some woe stories, just like how it was. I'm, I'm 17 years old. I'm fighting, you know, everything to try to make it to formula one and thinking it was real. And it really wasn't. You know, there was, again, it was all, it was all politics and money and, and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of wild shit going on. What do you mean that it really wasn't like, was it like a scam that was kind of set yeah, up type deal? It or? wasn't a scam, but like I said, it's just, it's just my story. But like, so, and, it, and it's so complex for people that don't understand racing. But like when I got chosen by Red Bull, I, I hadn't just gotten signed to a contract. I gotten chosen to go fight for the contract, you know? Gotcha. And then, so it was actually a hundred drivers down to 24 drivers uh, Travis Pastrana was actually there. This was in 2003. There was 24 of us competing to get down to the top six to go to Europe to drive a Formula Three car, which is just like two, you know, two categories down yep. from F1 car, and to and then only two from that top six would be signed to a contract to try to continue on to Formula One. 
And a uh, funny story is like Travis Pastrana was trying to like transition to four wheels a little bit. He wasn't even a Red Bull athlete yet. He was a Sobe energy drink guy. And, and we kind of knew each other from motocross days. And he had actually even come up to me and was like, Hey man, I, I know you somehow. And like we kind of, it was cool. You know, it was like talking about motocross. And again, this is 2003 and he was way off the pace. He was there just to try to like, to try to see where he was, but he was, he was really far off the pace. And then obviously later on, he, you know, his, his four wheel career started going, but so I made it from the, 20, the top 24, got narrowed down to six Americans. One of them was, uh, had already gotten chosen the year before, which was Scott Speed. Scott Speed was pretty, is a pretty well-known driver. He's a rallycross racer for Subaru now. He made it to Formula One briefly and, and had, a, had a, a career in NASCAR for a while. But anyway, so we, we go over to Europe. We do the shootout. And um, how it kind of goes is Red Bull didn't want me to begin with. Nothing against me. Again, it was all politics. There was a little bit of money involved. There was they wanted Scott Speed because of his he was a he was a top driver, one of the you know one of the best in America at the time. And he and I had fought a lot and you know uh, great friends, but battled a lot in, in go kart racing and and in, in even in open wheels, moving up a little bit. He was like a year or two older than me, so he'd already gotten chosen the year before in the driver search. And then I was product of what's called the second year of the search. And so they only wanted two drivers. One of them was like a friend of Scott's. And they had the same manager, and he was a good driver, and and so they wanted him. And then there was a, another driver who was paying a little bit of money. Like, right. he came from a very, very wealthy family, and he was subsidizing the ride. So Red Bull's like, okay, we'll take him because he's he comes with some money as well. One of the things that happened, though, is I was quicker than the driver bringing money, you know? And so, and this was all televised at the time, kind of like a reality show, and part of the problem was it was all, te- it was like out there, you know, like, Oh shit. Right. Oh shit. Well, Jaskel's fast. What are we going to do? So I wasn't from day one, like Red Bull didn't expect me to move on. Right. And so they were like, well, shit, we gotta, we can't not choose him because then people are going to question the program. Right. Cause he was one of the fastest here. And that's what I mean by, by politics and BS, right? Like they'd already kind of chosen before the program even started. Well, who was going to get what, you know? And, right. But then I was faster than they expected. People see that, and they're like, "Okay, well, all right, well, let's let's give Jaskel a championship." So basically, they they signed me to the contract. Said, "Okay, we're going to put him in this championship for a year." And the way, you know, the way my story goes, they kind of set me up for failure on purpose. They, they it was all it's all money, right? Like they had to pay. They paid like three hundred thousand dollars for me to race in this junior. Formula One type series. It was called right. Formula BMW. It's like a miniature, like a miniature F1 car. And um, they put me with a new team that had never raced before. You know, when when they could have put me with the championship winning team, you know, they were like, oh, we're going to put them with this team, save some money. And I don't think they expected me to do well. I, well, I went on to win, you know, multiple races, some of the biggest ones. And then again, it was very dramatic, but like, you know, I, I had to do the runoff or the, the shootout again the next year after the championship. And, and they tried to like manipulate it to where I was on bad tires and, you know, lap times are slower. I mean, like, these are just the kind of things that if you're involved in motorsports, you understand that these kind of things happen, you know, it's like, so what ended up happening? Uh, so I, I got to race for a year for Red Bull and it was amazing. Like I got to, again, it was very stressful. Um, the guy who ran the Formula One program for Red Bull for like 15 years, he was an ex F1 driver who uh, pretty famous. He 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 like lost his eye in Formula One racing. He was a he probably would have won a championship. Yeah, how did he lose an eye? A, a rock went through his visor, and this is like in the 70s. Are you, you know? serious? Yeah, yeah. So he was a famous F1 racing driver. He was a real man, like scary, you know, Austrian, really tough, you know, yeah. mean kind of guy. And, and if you got to know him, he was okay. But so I had to answer to him like every race. And this was genuinely what would happen. If, if I, if I won the race, I had to get on the phone with him and he'd be like, well, why didn't you win by more? You know? And if I finished second, oh, well, why didn't you win the race? You know? And, and those are the kind of, and you're, again, you're, t- you're 17, you're going on, you're not even 18 years old yet. And, and your stomach's turning every week, you know, it's like if you make a little mistake, are they going to fire you? Are you going to, are you going to have a contract the next year? You know, these are the kind of thing. What, where's my career going to go? You never knew. It was always uncertain, you know? You know, for an outsider's perspective, from somebody that did not grow up racing, it's really hard to comprehend it how is. much you did before you were 18 years old. Yeah, like, I look that's back. That's crazy. Yeah. And it, it, what's, what is frustrating about my life sometimes is like, I've had this amazing life that's shaped me into what I think I'm a, a pretty, you know, unique human being and, and have lived some pretty wild experiences. And, 
And it's because of, I, I hate that racing is so complex. That's what I love about it. That's what's led me to become a skydiver and stuff like that is because I like intricacy and complexity of things. And, but it also makes it so difficult to explain to people outside of that world yeah. what it's like because it is so twisted and complicated and, and complex and intricate that, you know, to try to explain to somebody what it was like as a 14, 15, 16 year old young man trying to fight for your life or a career, you know, it's hard. People, people don't fully understand, you know? Must have been tough, dude. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for it, but it, it also was, um, you know, I wouldn't change Everything anything. happens for a reason, dude. Yeah, of It course. got you to where you are. Yeah, it did. Yeah. But, you know, it's like my father and I have talked about it a lot. And we were like, you know, if we knew then, you know, it's cliche, right? If, you knew, if we knew then what we know now, would we still do it? If would we, you? I don't, I, uh, it's tough to say. I don't know. If I would have known, if I would have known that racing was going to be so financially driven and politically driven, I guess if I would have known that motorsports is one of the, Few sports in the world, or one of the only sports in the world, arguably, where talent is not rewarded over money. Money is rewarded over talent. That if you are extremely good, you are better than this guy, but this guy has a million dollar budget, he's going to get the ride and you're not. You know, and, and so, and it's even worse now. It's fucking wild. Yeah, man. And it's even worse now. The days of like drivers just being really talented, like, like the Bush brothers and in, in NASCAR or some of this, I mean, it's like, it's even far because racing costs so much money, you know, fine. And in, in the world has changed that you have to bring budget. Talent is just not enough. You know, you could literally be completely faster than this other person. And if they have money, you're not going to get in the seat, you know? And, and so we're talking about nepotism. I got to race NASCAR the last couple of years and it's tough, man. You know, like I'm racing with low budget equipment and that's another thing that people don't know about racing that, you know, you have to pay to get your, to get in the seat. You know, it's not like I just got found and scouted and got put in a car, a sponsor who I've known for 20 years said, Hey man, I love you. I love your story. I followed you since you were, you know, 15 years old. I believe in you and I want you to be racing for my brand. So he wants to be in NASCAR, this brand, autopartsforless.com, friend of 20 years. And he goes, hey, look, I want to be in NASCAR and I want you to represent my brand and I want you to drive. So now we have to go find a team. In NASCAR, in the Xfinity Series, which is, you know, Saturday, right below Cup Series, the price to go race in an Xfinity car ranges from anywhere between 150000 per race as low as thirty five thousand dollars a race. What? Guess which team we <laughs> guess which team we raced for. We raced for my sponsor only had the budget to race with the thirty five thousand dollar a race team. And that's what I mean. What? Like it's I mean, crazy. Thirty five thousand dollars a race is a lot of money, dude. That's a lot of fucking money for yeah. one race, man. And there's teams that charge a hundred and fifty thousand dollars per race. That's insane. I know. It's fucking really insane. I'm like, why did I choose this? Why did I choose this sport? And that's what I mean by if I would have known then what I know now, maybe I would have started skydiving at 18 years old rather than, rather than pursue racing. I, I mean, racing has been obviously the greatest, most unique thing in my life. It's my identity now, fortunately, unfortunately. Like who I am is, is a racing driver and, and I'm getting older, but I still have my my dream is to still be successful in motorsports. You know, like every racing driver isn't, it's not just about going to Formula One. It's not just about winning the Indy 500 or the Daytona 500, winning these marquee races. For me and for a lot of drivers, even young even young men, it's, if I, I can, I can bring in some freaking really amazing, well-spoken 12, 13-year-old kids, male or female, and say, what do you want to be? I just want to be, I want to be a professional race car driver. What does that mean to you? I want to get paid to be in a race car. Even kids are changing these days. Like before it used to be more grand. You go back to the nineties. It was like, I want to be a formula one world champion. I want to be, I want to win the Indy 500. I want to win the Daytona 500. You can ask a kid now. Cause they know how that, you know, it's more exposed now, like years down the road, right? It's everything's, everything's, um, I, I kind of feel like the world is more about transparency now. Like things, Absolutely. We, we, things have just been around long enough that we know there ain't no fucking bullshitting. We know what's going on. Right. So, I mean, you, you know, more people, if, if you watch NASCAR as a hardcore fan, they talk about it more. They talk about the low teams and the high teams and the budget and things like that. And formula, if you go watch drive to survive on Netflix about formula one, 
they'll, they'll straight up talk about who's paying money and how the budgets work and why this driver gets this seat and that seat. And, and so it's just more exposed now and, uh, it's just more out in the open. And so young kids the you know, they're, they're educated to it as well. And they're like, I just want to make a living to be in a race car. And that's, and that's kind of where I'm at these days too. And again, you can play it. You can play that hand. Yep. You have to, you don't have a choice. You have to play that hand. And, um, and how you play that hand determines, it determines your life, you know? And, and so I go both ways. I've, I've lived, I've had some pretty, pretty emotional, pretty horrific things that have happened in my life. Like a lot of us have, and where I've questioned about everything happens for a reason. You know, I used to really believe that and I still do to a certain extent, but at the same time with some of the things I've, I've experienced and seen, I, I do think that sometimes things just happen and, but you still have to play those cards that you're dealt, you know, and, and move on with life. So, so to, so to, 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 I digress. So to go back a little bit to that whole Red Bull thing. So yeah. So in 2004, I'm racing for Red Bull. It's not as glamorous as it sounds. You know, it's like, it's stressful. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, like I remember I was standing on the podium. I just won a big, I'd won at Laguna Seca, one of the most famous racetracks in the world. And I had just beaten like who became a, a very dear friend and a very successful indie car driver, a guy named James Hinchcliffe, Canadian, and another very successful driver that was on, and I was on the top. And I had broke a record that year. I, I won by the largest margin of victory ever in that series by seven seconds, which is an eternity on a racetrack. And you see my face. It was the last race of the year. I didn't win the championship because we had a few mechanical DNFs. And so I finished like third in the championship. And I knew that, fuck, if I don't win the championship, Red Bull might fire me. And so I'm standing on the podium at the last race and it was televised. And it, it hurts me to this day. Like I see, I've seen the video. I wish I had it. And you see my face and I'm, I just won one of the biggest races of the year, the last race of the year, set a, set a wet record. And my face is literally like this. And I look pissed because I, because I was fucking upset. I was like, "Fuck! I don't know if I'm gonna have a, I don't know if I'm gonna job next year. I might get fired. I might not. You know, Red Bull's gonna find a reason to let go. You know, because I didn't win the championship. And they told me I had to win the championship. That's what I mean, man. I'm 17. I think I had just turned 18 that that month, or I was just about to turn 18. And I was like, "Fuck! I might not have a racing career. I don't know what I'm gonna do. My family doesn't have the money for me to go race the next championship. I have to have this Red Bull contract, otherwise my career might stop." So you you know? just won the biggest race of your life yeah essentially i won the biggest race of my life and you were pissed and i was fucking devastated because i was like shit i don't know what's gonna happen next so year. what happened i lost my ride and it's a very very complex story of how i lost my ride it, it was all in to me like again it's just my story somebody from red bull will be like that's a bullshit lie but i mean it it was pretty fucked how it all went down so so it was the end of the year and it was like before october and and so Red Bull was like, okay, now the third year of the driver search was happening. They were going to, they found, you know, they were going to introduce maybe one or two other new Americans, f maybe fire one or two Americans. And so they tell me, they, they, they lie to me, straight up lied. I mean, they, they had me uh, pack my bags. They told me I was moving to Europe to race in the next category up which was a, it was called Formula Renault. Renault is a car manufacturer, but it's a, in, you know, Formula One type yep. car called Formula Renault. And so they tell me, you're going to race. Uh, I, I was dating a girl at the time, this German girl we'd been dating for a couple of years almost. And, and so she lived, she was from Germany and they're like, they, and Red Bull knew they're like, oh yeah, no, you're going to, we're going to put you with this team. You're good. Everything's fine. Great job. You won some of the biggest races of the year and you know, you, you, you did well. And, but, oh, but you got to come back to the runoff. In, in Europe to go what's, what's the runoff the runoff was like the competition gotcha. to continue the and even my manager and I were like well, why am I going back there oh no it's just to get you extra seat time you just get to go drive the F3 car again but but no you're good you're you're move you know here the, this is the team you're going to race with and everything we had we had questions of if whether that was true or not and they were like no but you got to come back to the runoff and drive the car again and, and, and I was like against all the other, against the new drivers. Like, why am I doing that? And I was always quite like something, something didn't smell right. You know, it was kind of like, mm. and so I go, I go over to Europe. It was in Portugal. And, and so my manager was with me and we go to get in the car. And again, this is all like televised. They were televising on speed channel. Speed channel was like the biggest yep. motorsports channel at the time. Right. And, um, and there was like, kind of like this little documentary going on about it. And so, so they, I go there and. And I, I mean, like I said, I call it straight up sabotage. You know, there's different times of day that are faster than other times, like early in the morning, the, the motors run a little bit better than, than the hotter part of the day, the tires get hot, you know, so, so they, they kept pushing me off to the afternoon session and, and already I was kind of rolling my eyes like what's going on. And, 
And then they tried to put me in a car that had really used tires because another driver, and we were like, no, 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 that's bullshit. Put on some other tires. Like, oh, no, no, it's fine. What they were trying to do is, in my opinion, kind of what happened, they were trying to get me in the car and show that my lap times weren't that quick so that they could, oh, you know, we're not going to, yeah, we're not going to renew you your contract. You just had an unfair advantage. Yeah, so they kept trying to set it up, but we we had, luckily, we put our foot down. We're like, no, fuck you. Put on new tires. Nope, not doing that. Nope, we'll go out, we'll go out when the sun goes down. You know, So we kind of managed it and, and put me out there, and I go out, and I'm faster than the year before. Didn't put a wheel off, you know, drove perfectly. Some drivers, like, had spun out, got in the dirt, whatever. So I did everything I'm supposed to do because we knew, like, things just didn't feel right, you know? Like, yeah. they were looking to, again, it's all politics and money. Red Bull had just bought their first Formula One team. Red Bull at the time had How only— How much is a Formula One team? They bought, they bought the, the Jag F1 team, the Jaguar F1 team, for $400 million. God. Uh, and this was back in 2004. So they bought, yeah, it was like, I don't know, 600 million a day yeah. or something, right? So they just bought a Formula One team. We knew that. And there's other athletes, okay? Like, there wasn't, there's obviously hundreds of athletes all over the world. Red Bull wasn't anywhere near as big as it is today, but there was, you know, surfers and, and snowboarders. And there's all kinds of stuff yeah, going everything. on. And they had a pretty big motorsports program. There was four Americans, only four, which is still cool. There's only four Americans. But there was another like ten European drivers that are all trying to fight to get to Formula One. Right. So it's not it's not, there, there was the Americans fighting against each other to get to Formula One, and then there's like a whole group of like ten or even fifteen junior Red Bull F1 drivers fighting to get to you know Sebastian Vettel was one of them. He was my roommate for a short time. Amazing guy. He's ended up being a four time world champion, and um, so he was a, he was in the form the, in the Red Bull driver F1 program as well at the same time I was, and. Um, and so, anyways, they were looking to cut budget. We kind of knew that. And, and they wanted to focus on the drivers that they wanted or just the one driver they wanted, which was Scott Speed. We always kind of knew that. Scott was quick. He, he had the name. His, his, that's his actual yeah. name, Scott Speed. They, you know, the marketing behind it. And so that was their focus. They didn't want me. It didn't matter how good. Even though I was good and did everything I was supposed to do and was fast and, and, and was like, you know, they even did polls and stuff. Like, I was a favorite among Americans. Like, you know, if you, you know, they did these polls, which yeah. was amazing. Like, who's the favorite to go to Formula One? I was at the top of the poll one time, you know, like. So, it was all looking good. And so, I do the shoot. I do the test, right? And ironically, it was the day before my 18th birthday. And it was October 14th. And, I, and I'm, I'm kind of nervous. And it was a big deal. Like, when I say it was a big deal, like, the spokesperson, and he was kind of like a manager of mine, like a, he was like a, a mentor during my season, was a guy named Danny Sullivan. If you're a f motorsports fan, Danny Sullivan won the 1986 Indy 500 against Mario Andretti. So he's a fame. He was a uh, he. He raced in Formula One. He was one of he was a pre a very older American driver, or a, you know, American that made it to Formula One way before Michael Andretti. And so, so he was like the spokesperson of the American F1 program, and he was my guy. And he's a you know he's a legend in motorsports. And so he was arguing for me. Like in the there was this very surreal moment, and there's a photo of it. It's pretty cool. And I'm I'm looking at Danny Sullivan who's the American, you know, kind of spokesperson of the F1 driver search program, and Helmut Marco, who is the director of motorsports for, for Formula One Red Bull, who, who, again, was the director for Formula One for, for 15 years for Red Bull, was there. He, like, literally just retired, you know, almost 15-plus years down the right. road. And so they're arguing, and I see them up on their, they're, like, up on the pit wall, and they're fighting. They're, like, raise, they're raising their hands, and, they're, and I'm like fuck, that doesn't look good. <laughs> like, I knew, I just, you know, had that feeling. I knew something wasn't right, you know? Right. So I'm like, I'm watching it all go down, and, and then, they're f and I walk away, I go into the garage, and then Danny comes down, he goes, hey, Matt, I need to talk to you. I'm like, okay, cool. So we go into the, sh we go into the bus privately, no cameras, no nothing. He goes, hey, man, uh, they're letting you go. I'm almost catatonic. Like, I look at him, and I didn't believe him. I, I, I'll never forget this moment. He sits me down privately and goes, Hey man, they're letting you out of your contract. And I and I go, <laughs> fuck you, man. Fuck you, Dan. Where are we going to dinner tonight, man? And he just looks at me and he like doesn't even make eye contact and he goes, No, nah, man, they're letting you go. It was surreal. It was like out of a movie, you know, and it's like I was like, What? How? Why? What the fuck? It, what's going on? He was like, I don't know, man. I'm sorry, but you're on a plane back home tomorrow. So why'd they let you go? Just you don't even know. You no, never, no, you never no got reason, the, no the actual answer. No, no reason other than they didn't want me in the pro. You know, like that. I did. My, I got my year out of it, and they didn't want to continue my contract. So, know? what did you end up doing moving forward from that? Like, 
Because I know you, you touched base on the skydiving stuff a little bit. Yeah. Which, that came way, that came 10 years down the road. Well, we got we to we we jump up a little <laughs> yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, obviously continued racing. Yeah, well, I went home. I flew home on my birthday and, like, was, and I remember being on the airplane. I was like, fuck, what am I going to do? Like, this is, you know, pre-social media, pre-smartphones. How old you at this time? I, it was my 18th birthday. I just God gotten damn. fired from Red Bull. And I'm fl- on a plane back to the U.S. And I don't even know what to do. I don't know how to call my... I was flying back to New York to my girlfriend who had packed bags and so we could move to Germany for my second year in my Red Bull program. I literally got on the plane and didn't call anybody. It was like an eight-hour flight back to New York. And I just sat in the plane. I'll never forget. I just sat in the plane kind of floating. Like I, I didn't call my family. I didn't call anybody because I didn't know how to tell everybody, hey, I just right. got fired. I just, lost, I just lost my ride. And I don't know what I'm going to do next year. And what's even worse, it's October. It's the end of the year. Like to try to, like deals are usually sewn up, done. Like, you know, it's too late to find money and find another ride and stuff like that. And and so I had to tell, like, I don't, I, th- I don't remember. It was so long ago. But I think I, I think I did wait till I got back to New York and I called my family. I'm like, I'm out. I'm done. I, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I lost my program. I lost the ride. And, um, I remember my dad being like pissed off and, oh, it's cause you did, the, you know, typical father. Yeah. You know, he was, ah, it's cause of this, cause of that, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, so I, what so did you end up doing? I, it, it, that's too long of a story to even explain. Like okay. I got lucky, you know, like I, I, I say luck, but I ended up finding a little bit of sponsorship money. I raced a couple races in an American, like, junior, you know, American open wheel series that, you know, like, a a feeder series to IndyCar, as we call it. I did a couple races there, finished on the podium, both races, ran out of money. So I was, like, I was actually leading the rookie of the year points, second in the championship, run out of fun. It was about, back then, it was 30 grand a race just to run this junior formula car championship. Then I ended up getting a ride in a stock car in a, and it was, it was kind of like out of the, it was cool at the time. It was like right out of days of thunder. Like here's this open wheel guy lost his ride. And this team says, Hey man, we'll give you a shot in our NAS. And it was, it was a truck. It was like a, um, it was like a junior NASCAR truck. Right. And, um, like a lower level NASCAR truck series. And so they're like, Hey, we'll give you a shot in this. I had never raced a fender car. I came from go-karts, open wheel formula. That was my whole life's going towards yep. formula one. Like, Hey, we'll give you a shot in this car. Never been on an oval track, never really raced ovals. So like, if you're a days of thunder fan, it was like right out of the, it's like <laughs> showed up and like, Oh, you're that open wheel kid. Huh? Yeah. I was like, yeah. And they're like, Oh, what happened? Lost my, you lost my ride. And like, All right. So you ever driven anything like this? Nope. Saw it on ESPN though. Coverage yeah. is excellent. You'd be amazed what you can pick up. Like that was the story. So I get in this car and it's the first race of the year, and it's, you know, so it's 2005, and I finished second at the first race. And the team, and he, the whole team, and it was a big championship, 30 cars, you know, t- really, you know, stacked field, you know, diff- really fast drivers. And it was for a, the owner of United Nissan here in Vegas, if you know United Nissan. And so I finished second, and the team, and it was just supposed to be like a one-race deal just to get me in the truck. Right. And, the, and we were paying. We had to pay like five grand to race. My pay, we didn't really have the money, so we wrote a check for five grand for me to get in the seat. And I finished second. And they were like, all right, we'll let you go to the second race. Second race of the year was here in Vegas, where, you know, where the Bush brothers started their career yep. and stuff. And so the second race of the year happens, and I fucking win it. Dominate the race. And every and even everybody's just like, what the hell? And even I'm kind of like, oh, I guess I'm all right at this yeah. shit, you know? I'm all right at this roundy round stuff. And the team owner, like, again, dramatic. Like, I, he literally tears up the check, the five grand check that we wrote for that race, tears up and goes, and he was this, he's this, I'm still talking today, he's a southern dude, his name's Lee. He's like, all right, kid. All right, you got the full seat, man. We'll give you the full season. All right, here you go. And so, and then I went on to win the championship. I was the first rookie to ever win the title in the history of the championship. And that carried my career, you know, and that, there was a big story behind that. You know, F1, F1 washout, you know, like Red Bull washout. And then, and just kept fighting, man. Just fucking don't give up. Is right. you know, Like I wasn't, I, as much as I was devastated and didn't know what I was going to do with my career and felt like everything was falling apart, like my racing career is falling apart. I was like, okay, just got to fucking move forward. Just go to the next thing. Whatever I got to do, just fight and grind and and tr- keep trying to prove yourself that you belong in a seat and that you're fast and that this is what you need to be doing with your life. And I win the championship. And again, it was the, like nothing was ever guaranteed. I was the first rookie in the history of the championship to win the title. Nobody ever did ever after that. And and then the next year, the team was like, oh, man, we're going to take you full season. We're going to pay for everything. And then the team goes, ah, you know, actually, we don't have the money. We're going to stay in the same championship. So if you want to move on to the next, I couldn't stay there. Like, I needed to 
continue moving forward. Right. So now, now I have no support again. So now that I just won this championship and the team's like, Hey, sorry, we're not moving forward. We're going to stay in this championship. You can stay here and race or you got to go on your own. So then we go out on our own and we start racing late model, late model NASCAR, NASCAR super late model, which is kind of like, you know, the feeder series going to NASCAR. We start our own team. We come up with our own money. We start winning races. You know, now we're 2007. So 2006 was kind of a struggle year for me. And then 2007, I'm winning all the biggest races, like the same races. Kyle Busch is even showing up to race. I'm beating Kyle. I'm winning the biggest super late model stock car races in Vegas. And, and then goes into 2008, we're doing good. Economic collapse. My parents, we basically like house scores in foreclosure. We lose everything. We're just, just like everybody else, man. We almost, yeah. we almost lost everything. We're almost, we're almost losing our house. We're losing everything. And, um, and then there was no money. There, everybody, like a lot of racing drivers around the entire world got into forced retirement. Like right. there, there was no money, to, no sponsorship to continue racing. And I just needed to help pay bills. I needed to just keep our house, you know, and like, yeah. and, you know, eat. And so, so then I started working as a racing instructor, you know, and that's how that part of my life happened. That Now I'm working at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway and fast forward a couple of years, I end up becoming, I start doing triathlons just because I wanted to compete. It was cheap. I just wanted to race. I just didn't care whether I'm racing my body or a car. Can't afford to fucking race a car. So I go race bicycles now. So, yeah. so I'm doing triathlons and, and just, um, and you know, a little bit bitter about motorsports. And so I start working at the speedway as the chief instructor of a racing school. And, and I'm, I'm always, tr I never gave up. I never turned my back on racing. You know, it's like as much as I felt like racing turned its back on me, I still would race like the biggest go-kart race of the year. Once a year, I'd scrounge up the money yeah. for that just to try to stay relevant, you know, like do a big race, show that I'm still here. You know, I, I stayed fit. That was the biggest part of my life. You know, it's like, I'm in the gym every day. I'm sharp. I'm fit. If, if an opportunity comes up, I'm ready, you know, and I was always, you know, maintaining relationships, you know, with potential sponsors. And that was kind of the, kind of my journey through like 2000, let's say 10 all the way until like 2015 or something like that. You what know? brought you to skydiving? Uh, depression. Really? <laughs> yeah, a little bit, to be honest. Yeah. I was working at the Speedway as the chief instructor of dream racing, a racing, like a driving experience, not even a racing school, more like a driving experience. And people would always say like, oh, man, you got the coolest job in the world. You're, you're, you just get to drive race cars and supercars every day. The way I, the way I equated it to was like, imagine a, a baseball player and he's still young. He's still fit. He still throws a hundred mile an hour fastball and he can still knock it out of the park, but he's working at a batting cage. Like that was what it felt like to me. My fucking life was withering away, sitting on a bench at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway. You know, like this is not what my family and friends and everybody that supported my life and worked really hard for me to have this career. This is not what they envisioned me doing. This is not what I worked my entire fucking life working for is to sit on a fucking park bench at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway and and teach Joe's to, you know, risk my life around and sit right seat in a race car or, or in a supercar like that. I know it sounded cool. That's a super good analogy. Yeah, I, I mean, I was grateful to have a job and be doing something that, but my God, it was not what I fucking wanted to right. be doing. And I was depressed. Like, I would go to work every day and be like, fuck this. This is not what I should be. Like, I felt like my life was a waste. Like, what did I just dedicate my entire life to to do this? Like, no, oh, this isn't okay. So you said, fuck it, I'm going to go jump out of a plane? Kind of, yeah. Like, it's like a lot of people, man. Like, I, I was dating a girl for a very long time. I was in a relationship for like eight years, right? So, like, that relationship ended. I turned 30 years old. That was like, oh, God. I, fuck, you know, as a, as a, anybody getting older is always difficult, right? But like, turning 30 as a motorsports athlete, when everybody's like, oh, man, your window is, you better, you know, Jasko, if you don't get in a car soon, you're, you know, you're racing career is over you know you're getting old you know you just hear all this bullshit and and so I'm, I'm getting older I'm not happy with my life I'm genuinely depressed about my family I'm like here I have my my mother and father not living the greatest life because they worked really fucking hard and spent a lot of money on my racing career and I'm not I'm not supporting them the way I thought I would be at my age. And, and that was always the goal. Like that was my dream actually genuinely it wasn't just to fucking race cars. It was to be able to do what I was good at, do what I devoted my entire life to and support my family and, yeah. and give them, give them the light, the quality of life that I had growing up, you know? And so I just wasn't fucking happy with anything. And, and so the guy, he was like one of the owners of the, of the driving experience he was a, he's a billionaire, like he, you know, helicopter pilot, skydiver, wingsuit, base jumper. And I was fucking terrified to skydive. I had no, I'd always see it, but I wasn't like, yeah, I'm going to go skydive. I was just like, oh man, I don't know if I can do that. 
I'm not an adrenaline junkie as much as people think that I'm an, I'm a calculated athlete, you know, like I, I'm not an, adre- I'm a life junkie. I always say, t- t- you know, tag that coin, like coin that word. Like I, I want to live life, but I wasn't, I wasn't trying to go be crazy and jump, do backflips. And, uh, you know, Pastrana is a, 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 an adrenaline junkie. I wasn't. And I would guess total upset. I know people think that about people think I'm an adrenaline junkie. I just want to fucking live and experience life and share it with other people and, and help other people live their life and push past fears and, and stuff like that. I genuinely, that's, that's what, that's what sets my soul on fire truly. And is not just doing cool shit. It's doing it and sharing it with people. I'm not saying, look at me. It's saying, fuck, come with me. Come do this. It changed my life. Let me help you do it. You know, it's, yeah, no, I don't have all the money in the world. I fucking put it on a credit card a lot of times, but these are the life experiences that I think people should be experiencing, you know? And yeah. so, so I got talked into going on a skydive and it was right at, right around my 30th birthday. So kind of like a quarter life crisis. Mid-life yeah, crisis. midlife, yeah. Mid, hopefully not midlife, yeah. but you know, more like quarter life crisis. And so, I jump out of an air and again, I wasn't racing. I'm not happy. I jump out of an airplane. I'm fucking terrified. And so this is, it's a cool story. Like I, I do a tandem. I did a tandem jump with this amazing guy who ended up being my, my uh, train, the guy t- taught me how to skydive. So I jump out of the airplane. I get on the ground. I look up and I'm like, shit. Okay. How do I do this on my own? And he was like, you serious? I'm like, I'm serious. He goes, come to my house tonight. I went to his house that night. A couple other people were there. We did ground school, six hours of ground school, watching videos on YouTube, like how you can die, how, you know, cut away, reserve, the, watch, and then I soloed the next morning. What? Yeah, man. <laughs> you can do it like that. And is that even legal? Yes, it is. Yeah, so you do a tandem. So, I mean, every- Don't you every, have to have a certain amount of tandems before you could just go- Nope. To- what, fuck, mo, mo, most places, it's all about money. Everything's about money, about generating money. So, like, usually they want you to do two tandems, and then you do a ground school, and then you go solo. And solo means you're under your own parachute, but usually you have one or even two instructors flying with you, holding on to you from either end. But this was a- a kind of an accelerated, it's actually called uh, AFF, Accelerated Free Fall. That's the name of, of skydive school around the around the world usually. It's called AFF. I want to do that. Yeah, man, I'm sure you do. We t- we, we, we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so as as my cousin's shaking her head now, you yeah. know, he's like, absolutely not. <laughs> no. uh, it could change your life. But it, I mean, listen, well, again, it's, it's a, I used to say, oh, it's a safe sport. No, 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 fuck. It's a dangerous sport that can be done safely. And so I needed something in my life. I needed something intricate. I was flying airplanes. I had, so I, I was getting my pilot's license, but it was too expensive. I, I had like 50 hours. I was literally like getting signed off to get my pilot's license. I was flying around solo because I, I loved the intricacy of piloting. I'm, right. I'm an aviation geek already. I love airplanes, but I just wanted to apply myself to something. You know, I wasn't even looking to get my commercial rating and be a professional pilot. I just wanted to do something since I wasn't racing. Right. You know, I needed something intricate. A lot of racing drivers are like this. There's a lot of racing drivers that quit racing and end up becoming pilots or hell, just because they, they need something. You know, racing drivers are a different breed, you know, right. I believe, you know. And so, so anyway, so skydiving, I, I stopped flying planes. It was expensive. And skydiving was kind of that medium and where it's, it's like, wow, this is pretty inexpensive and relative to, you know, other sports and things like that, cheaper than flying the airplane. And so, yeah, so I solo, so I, I can do a tandem. I go to ground school. I solo the next day within, within two weeks, I'm a licensed skydiver. And it, and again, it's a whole nother journey in my life, but it changed my entire life in a very spiritual way. Like it connected me to some of the most unique and amazing individuals from around the world. I got to, you know, I didn't have a lot of money, but I would work very, very hard, stack up some money, and then go on a trip and, and leave for like five to 10 days and travel somewhere exotic and skydive in some crazy place like over the, you know, over the pyramids in Egypt or, you know, in Which Alaska. You were the, one of the first people. Yeah, I got invited because the skydiving community is this really amazing community where it's like you, you would see I'm doing something, you would think it costs like tens of thousands of dollars because it's a group of like 50 or 100 or people that come together. It's like these these events end up becoming very, very affordable. affordable. Yeah, very affordable. And so, yeah, so skydiving changed my life. Like I was making good money. I was making six figures, you know, more. I was the chief instructor of the racing school. I was the chief instructor for the Bridgestone Teens Drive Smart program. I'm doing some stunt driving. I'm doing this. I'm working 300 days a year. Like just, you know, lack of a better term, tor- horrible term. I'm blowing my brains out. Just like, just, just crazy traveling, trying to make money, trying to stay, again, a little bit out of depression, right? Just trying to stay busy. Like I just, I'm not happy. So I'm just like traveling, r- working, as, taking any gig I can, just killing myself, working 30, 40 days in a row, 40 days was like my longest stretch, zero day off, seven days, just 40 straight days, 
take a day or two off and I was like, I can't do this. this is not sustainable. I'm going to, I'm going to end up killing myself. Like I can't do this. And so, so then skydiving saved my life is, is fucking crazy. That sounds right. Like I, I took a pay cut by half. Like I stopped working. I, I, I quit like half the gigs I was doing around the country and was like, I'm only going to work this job. I don't care how much money I make and I'm going to travel the country or the world and I'm going to go skydive. And, um, and it filled a void in my life, the, the void obviously being racing, you know, and so I, I couldn't go racing as much as I tried. The funding wasn't there. The sponsorship wasn't there. It wasn't realistic. My father during, you know, we didn't get into that. My father has a heart attack in 2015. While I'm working at the track, I get a phone call from my mother. Your father's just had a heart attack. And I said, is he alive? And she goes, I don't know. I, I leave. I literally am running the, I'm running the place. I'm the chief instructor, track manager. I point at somebody, I go, you're in charge. I got to go. I leave uh, and my father, and he wasn't expected to survive. He was like on life support for days. The, the doctors pulled me aside days later away from him. And they go, hey, man, we don't know if we can do the surgery on your father. And I was like, well, what do you mean? They go, and they just stare at me, like waiting for me to understand, like, oh, we might not be able to do the open heart surgery because of his condition, blah, blah, blah. So they weren't even sure if he was going to live. And so, yeah, so I quit my job overnight at the Speedway. I ended up taking over the family business, which was failing, failing wood business, you know, it was in bankruptcy essentially. And I'm taking care of my mother. I'm even taking care of my, my brother, my older brother a little bit, taking care of my father. And, and then to me, what was really hurtful is people would be, or it's like weird, right? People were just praising me like, oh, it's so amazing you're doing that. And I was like, isn't this what you're fucking supposed to do? Like my family gave me everything I've had in my life. I can't, and it fucking sucks, man. Like it sucks to even have people close in your life who questioned, you know, like, oh, you need to do a lot for your family. You know, like, why do you do so much for your family? I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. They gave me every, everything I am is because of my parents. The, the, un, the most unbelievable life, all these opportunities, everything I've done is because my parents gave me these opportunities. I'm not going to, to me, I thought I, it wasn't even like a question. I just, I quit my job over no, that night and, and jumped into the family business and figured out how to run it so that my family wouldn't lose everything. You know, my yeah. father wouldn't lose his business that paid bills and put a roof over my head most of my entire life. So, so I took over the family business and then, well, and then I, I tried to find balance between running the family business and trying to live my life, which was not racing, but skydiving. And, and that filled the void in my life of not racing and, and, and that journey that took me on a detour, as I like to say. And then, Maybe we can get into it some other time, but then years later is is kind of crazy how life doesn't always happen in the time frame you expect, you know, but it can still happen if you don't give up, you know? Yeah. So I always stayed true to who I was and what I wanted in life, even though it wasn't realistic at the time. I didn't, I never gave up on racing. I just got taken on a detour, yeah. you know? And, uh, and years later, because of the relationships that I built, because of the relationships that I built, because of what my family allowed me and gave me the opportunity to do, that's what put me in NASCAR a couple of years ago. And and um, which you were the first person in history to skydive and yeah. do your own. What is it? You're you're the first person in history to skydive into, into your his own, own race. race. Yeah, first racing driver in history to skydive into his own race and a NASCAR, a professional NASCAR race at that at my hometown. And I it, like. Honestly, I still look back on it like, I cannot believe NASCAR said yes to that. Like, when you know the whole, it took months to get approval. Like, I went to NASCAR. I was like, hey, what if I skydived into my race, like, during driver intros? And they're like, what? <laughs> like, yeah, like, in my driving suit and everything. And they're like, and it, what was amazing is NASCAR was like, you can do that? I was like, well, yeah. I mean, believe it or not, I'm more, sadly, I'm more current skydiving than I am racing NASCAR lately. <laughs> like, yeah. I've been racing NASCAR ever, you know, like, this is my first year racing NASCAR, but I'm a professional skydiver, and, uh, yeah, if we could do this, I'll, you know, raise some money for charity and skydiving during driver intros, and so the Las Vegas Motor Speedway said yes, and again, it's all about relationships, and, and, and I try to tell that story more, that's what's more important to me than anything, is the relationships that I've developed over the course of 25 years of, of, following a good life, you know, being, you know, even though life didn't always work out the way I expected, I didn't just turn my back on everything. I still stayed friends and kept those relationships and, and built yeah. those relationships. And because of those is what helped me to create, to do something that even if people don't understand why I did it, it was important to me and to my family. Like 
it wasn't just about doing something badass. Like everybody's like, oh, you skydived into your race. It was emotional for me. I cried when I landed. The guy that taught me how to skydive was in the landing area with me. My parents, my mother and father were there. I dedicated my entire life to racing and I never made it to race professional in my hometown. And finally it happened. 20, 20 years later than we all expected. But here I am racing NASCAR in my hometown and I skydived into the race. I raised $10,000 for children's charities. The, my sponsor is Auto Parts for Less, a guy that I met when I'm 15 years old racing go-karts in Las Vegas. It was to try to tell the story of... That's awesome. Yeah, it wasn't just about... Like, people don't understand the bigger story that was behind it for me. There was a much more a bigger emotional story to be told than, oh, I skydived into my own race, you know? And, like... Because it's, it's, it's almost funny, you know, you see drivers or people that are like, oh, whatever, you know? S- you know, some people... Nobody hated on it per se, but some people are like, okay, well, they don't know. You know, yeah. it's like you don't know what you don't know. You don't fucking know people's journey. You don't know you people's. You don't know what yeah, you don't know. You don't, you don't know what you don't know, man. And you don't know what people are going through. You don't know what people's journeys are, and um, and that's another lesson I've learned. And and so yeah, so it was important for me, for my family, to to do something like to bring both those worlds together. You know, I started skydiving because I wasn't racing, and now I'm racing professional in NASCAR and. So to bring both those worlds together was like the most incredible moment of my life. You know, like it was, even if nobody ever fully understands it, I still, I still got to do it for my, my family and the, and the people that made it possible for me to be there that day, you know? It's amazing. Yeah. And, uh, I know we're going to, well, we got to make it. How long have we been talking? Uh, over an hour. Over an hour? About an hour? Okay. Yeah. We're, we're over an hour. I talk a lot, so you shouldn't have given me the. Mike, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's okay. I think we're going to have to do a part two. Um, <laughs> we never even got into how I starved yeah. in the jungle yet. <laughs> I know, and I really want to get into that. Uh, we're going to have to do a, a part two about castaways. Yeah. Um, that happened in 2017. We'll preface for people that want to stay, that have enjoyed the story so far. And yeah. What, and and I, I hope people know and you know that I, it's almost like therapy, right? It is. Like to, to tell my story and share it for people that care, want to hear it, and want to know about it. I, and, to, and even more so with like family and stuff and to, to document it. Even for me, like I love looking back at stuff like this and yeah. seeing where I was at this moment in life. So well, I appreciate you letting me share this. It's important to hear about all the stuff, like, you know, all the hardships that you went through. And it's like a lot of people from the outside don't hear their perspective on like what racing is like. Like I had no idea how much politics went into it and, you know, all the shit that you had gone through. And like just to hear, you know, this, it was a long story, but it was, it, it, it took a while to understand how important every single piece of that was. And then at the end, you're like, man, you know, I, I skydived into my own race. Yeah. And it's <laughs> like, dude, all, like all of that stuff just like led up to that point. You right. Know, it's, 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 and it's, it's crazy. I, and I, I have such a tough balance. Like I, I don't want people to think that I'm like telling this, oh, I got screwed. Oh, fuck, what was me? No, it's, I actually think it's a fucking amazing story. Like yeah. it's led me to, I don't think I would change any of it. It has been such a cool, unique story that has made me the man I am. People ask me and I get emotional. People are like, like I've had shit happen to me where people look at me, significant others that I've been in my life and fa- close family. And they're like, you know, friends, they're like, dude, how do you just, how do you keep going? You know, and um, and even hearing that is what makes me want to keep going. You know, oh, yeah. it's like there, there's there's so many of us. Like I, I knew even just meeting you of like, no, we're never gonna. F- I'm not gonna fucking give up. I'd yeah. rather die before I give up. And you're gonna die where you're sitting, so you might as well die trying. You know, yeah. like, and and so, yeah. I mean, I, I try to tell the story because to me, it, it's emotional. It's my life, and it's a unique story. But I want to share with people like. You can keep fucking moving forward. Yeah, well, you might be reaching out to some 17-year-old kid that's going yeah. through some hardships or racing right now or be able to relate it to something completely different and just, you know, take the same analogy, right? Like maybe they're trying to play basketball or right. whatever. It might not even be a sport. Music. You know? I don't care. It's music. Yeah. You know, stu- you know what, whatever. Hollywood. Whatever it might be. I, I always say, like, I, it sucks. Racing is fairly unrealistic unless you have some funding behind you. You know, so it's, it's hard when kids are young driving. I want to be a racing driver, too. How do I do it? Usually I say something cynical, joking. I'm like, don't do it. Get golf clubs, get tennis rackets. Don't go racing because it's so difficult, you know, like, uh, and, and I'm looking at do my cousin. Golf? She, she, she raced motocross. She knows. I mean, she's been involved in motorsports her whole life. Seeing my journey, she even raced in motocross, the off-road stuff. Like she knows. So I see, I, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's special. Like I, I see her just like nodding her head cause she's lived it too, you know? Yep. And, and, um, yeah, it's just such a it's such a tough business. So yeah, I, I do like to sh- I do love to share the story for more of the emotional side of like if I would have given up, 
I got j- just recently, last year, I got to do some of the most fucking incredible stuff in my life. I raced NASCAR professionally. I skydived into my own race in 2021. Last year, I got to drive at the Daytona you know, Motor Speedway. I got to race multiple NASCAR races. Um, I had my highest NASCAR professional finish, you know, in the top 20, which is a big deal for a low budget team. So, and if, and if I would have given up, I, like I could have back in way back in 2008 and said, fuck this, I'm going to go sell houses or do it. And, and I, and I hate to say like, that's okay. It's okay when people have that journey, obviously to decide like I'm moving, I'm leaving this behind and I'm moving forward. That's all right too. But I want people to know that if you don't fucking give up, some amazing things can happen. And I've lived an amazing life in between. It wasn't like I was miserable the whole time in between that life of not racing, but it's like, shit, I never gave up. And, and, the, and the story's not over yet. I'm, by the way, I'm leaving to go to Daytona tomorrow to go race in uh, the sport, a sports car series. Uh, so I've never raced at Daytona, the most famous, one of the most famous racetracks in the world. I've driven there, but I've never got to race there, which is crazy. I never had to, I never got to take a professional start at Daytona. And it's happening for the first time next weekend because of a ride that I got through communicate, you know, through again, relationships and didn't have to come up with money for it. It's a, and so, so yeah, it's all, the story is still unfolding as we, as we, as we sit here and speak right now. And it's, and it's all because, I just, I never gave up, kept moving yep. forward. So. You know, I always say it's not what you know, and it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It is crazy. And like, I mean, you've built a really good name for yourself, and obviously people know you. Yeah. And, you know, you've, you've had some amazing opportunities for that. And, and a lot of that, again, I, I can't say it enough, it stems back from my family, mm-hmm. from going back to my cousin, her father, who literally I, I attribute to teaching me how to drive, taught me how to drive my very first go-kart. He was the, the king of smooth. Mm-hmm. Scott Shaver. He just, fuck, man. He was like the smoothest driver. Like people would still line is. up on this. Still is. People would line up on the fence to watch him drive. And he gave that to me. And later on, I became like known as like the smoothest driver. Like people would wa- stand on the fence to watch me drive. And I learned that from him, you know. And it wasn't my father. My father did a lot of stuff in my motorsports career. But S- Scott was actually the one who taught me how to drive a, how to drive four wheels and how to drive a go-kart. And his demeanor and everything I'd like to believe I took with me. And then my uncle Chuck who built my motors and mentored me through, and he, he was actually one that mentored a lot of like, you know, he, he would even, you know, smack me around figuratively speaking of, you know, like, you know, fucking don't give up. You know, like we knew a kid was cheating that we were racing against. We knew he was cheating. And my uncle was like, yeah, so what? So fucking go beat him. Even though he's cheating, you know, like his, he, his motors were illegal. We knew it. And he yeah. got caught a year later, you know, which was upsetting. Cause I, I remember being so upset because he stole wins from me, so to speak. And my uncle was like, Karma's a bitch. Yeah, but my uncle was tough on me. He was like, stop bitching about fucking some other driver. Go out there and focus on you. My uncle Chuck taught me that. He was like, stop focusing on other drivers. Focus on yourself. And, um, and yeah, man, it's like my whole family has helped make me who I am today. And, and the reason I don't give up and the reason I have worked really hard to have a good reputation and good integrity in my life is because of my family. Is to, you have a is, lot of gratitude, man. I, I just, I, like sitting across the table, man. <laughs> it's crazy. It's hard. I got to hold the emotions Oh, yeah. Back, no, so. I can tell. <laughs> um, well, thank you. Uh, it's been Thanks. amazing. I wish we had some more time. Uh, we'll have to get back with you when you get back from your race. Yeah, it'll be perfect. And talk about we'll Daytona. Be able to hear we'll about ta- that as well. Talk about the life journey in the jungle. <laughs> uh, which I'm very excited about. Cool. Uh, so if you guys aren't yet, make sure you guys like and subscribe to the video, to the channel. Uh, we're going to have Matt back on the show again here soon. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate you coming out, man, and good luck in your race. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for having me here. Yep. Love you guys. Thanks.